program directors, distinguished leadership of Fort Hare, University and Wilberforce, the Manya and the Matleke families, Premier of the Eastern Cape, Comrade Oscar Mabuyani, members of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress who are here, President of the ANC Women's League, Comrade Batabile Zamini, and other leaders of the ANC Women's League, both at national as well as at provincial and regional level. The newly installed committee of the ANC Youth League that is meant to lead the revival of the African National Congress Youth League, members of the Provincial Executive Committee of the ANC as well as the regional leadership, the leadership of alliance structures as well as leaders of broader democratic movement, the religious leaders, Amako Sietu, the students, comrades and friends and fellow South Africans. I'd like to thank the University of Fort Hare and Umama Charlotte Matlekes Alma Mater, Wilberforce University for organizing this lecture alongside the ANC Women's League as well. I'd like to thank also the leadership of the ANC in this province and indeed the Women's League for a most wonderful program that they organized for us earlier today where we paid homage to the life of Umama Ushalot Matlek at the place where she was born and grew up. And I also like to thank our comrades in the leadership of government here for putting together an innovative idea of memorializing a leader who paid who played such an important role in the development of our country and leading us to the democracy that we enjoy today. In three weeks time from now we will celebrate National Freedom Day in honor of the events of the 27th of April 1994. Freedom Day and Freedom Month is a time when we affirm the apex values of our Constitution, values of human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms in our country. It is also a time to reflect on the solid foundation laid by those who came before us, the giants of our struggle and movement on whose shoulders we stand today. Today, 150 years, rather today marks 150 years since the birth of Umama U Dr. Charlotte Matlaike. It is truly a rare moment to celebrate the life of someone who was born almost 40 years before the formation of the African National Congress. If the formation of the ANC in 1912 was a defining moment for our country, the life and the leadership of Charlotte Matlaike was an inspiration to many people in our country and continues to be precisely that. This moment gives us an opportunity to reflect 
on Charlotte McClurgis' life, her work, and also the times in which she lived as an African woman. It is when we look at her life against the, the very big canvas of the times in which she lived that we realize what a remarkable leader, a remarkable woman, and a remarkable mother that she was. We reflect on a life of an incredible woman who was a towering figure in our nation's history. And as a leader, she was well-rounded and rounded in a most remarkable way. Charlotte McLeague lived during a period when women in our country were regarded as minors and were denied opportunities to be educated, let alone to lead anything or to be leaders. It was a time when women were massively oppressed and exploited. Despite all these impediments and obstacles, Charlotte McClurge rose above the challenges that were present during the time when she lived. Her determination to succeed saw her gaining an education and becoming an educator, a missionary, a social worker, an activist, a communist, and an anti-colonial campaigner. Her activism turned her into, yes, a trade unionist as well. A trade unionist who actively campaigned against low wages for black workers and who was part of the formation of the mighty and gigantic industrial commercial union, the ICU. She was a champion for gender equality and one of the organizers of the anti-pass movement. This was a rare thing to have women leading such great movements at the time. It was also a very dangerous time for women to lead. In 1918, she formed the Bantu Women's League, the forerunner to today's ANC Women's League. So in a way, Comrade Batabile Tlamini, she was your president even in 1918. In that same year, she led a delegation to the then Prime Minister, Louis Bouota, to demand the abolition of passes and was part of anti-pass protests a year later. And these activities were precursors to the 1956 Women's March. She was also a public intellectual. Her output in the form of articles of pamphlets and representations and writings to panels and commissions lent empirical weight to her activism. In many ways, she was not just an armchair activist. She was a well-read activist and political leader who wrote, who reflected on issues much more than many of us do today. If she were around, I have no doubt that she would be teaching all of us the art of writing, the art of putting on paper our ideas, our concepts, our ideology, and everything that we believe in. She was published at a time when the voices of black, black women were being shut down and silenced. In publications like Umteteli Wabantu, 
she wrote in Isikosa on the so-called women question and called for women's social and political rights to not be neglected during the anti-colonial struggles. She was one of many leaders who were not only literate but who propagated the values and the principles of our movement in their published writings. This is a lesson we all need to learn from and emulate, I would say, from today. In his 1930 biography of her, titled What an Educated African Girl Can Do, who Dr. Alfred B. Puma wrote, I regard Mrs. McClurkey as a pioneer in one of the greatest of human causes, working under extraordinary difficult circumstances to lead a people in the face of prejudice, not only against her race, but against her sex." Close quote. It was from Wilberforce University that she graduated with a BSc in 1903 becoming the very first black South African woman to get a university degree. And as I said earlier today, and it was just not a Mickey Mouse degree, it was a Bachelor of Science degree, a serious degree. I'm not downplaying and those who get other degrees, including my own degree. I got a law degree, but I'd like to believe she got a higher degree. <laughs> there can be no doubt that much of who she would become was shaped by her exposure at Wilberforce to currents, to trends, and to ideologies like socialism, class struggle, pan-Africanism, and the new Negro movement. Umamu Charlotte McClurkey initially entered academia to prepare for life as a missionary in Africa, but during her studies, she came to appreciate the international character of the struggle against racism and colonialism, and she, that expanded her worldview. She was taught by the legendary sociologist, historian and activist and pan-Africanist, W.E.B. Du Bois. They continued to correspond over the years, even after she returned to South Africa. In their letters, between herself and W.E.B. Du Bois, they discussed how to mobilize around upcoming Pan-African conferences and meetings. This immediately showed her Pan-Africanist character. This is an aspect of her legacy that is often not given due recognition. Like her contemporaries, Pixliga Isaka Seme, John Langalibale Ledube, Alfred B. Kuma and others, Charlotte McClurkey was a progressive internationalist and a pan-Africanist at that, long before liberation movements around the world adopted these two concepts, internationalism and pan-Africanism, as their doctrines. Charlotte McClurkey and Du Bois also spent time discussing education as a vehicle of national development. This is particularly important to today's theme of women in academia in the 105th year of Charlotte McClurkey. Charlotte and her husband, Dr. Marshall McClurkey, founded the Wilberforce Institute in Everton in Gauteng that is still standing till today. 
Over the years, they did important work in primary and secondary education. And I want to speak briefly about their union, their wonderful marriage, because it offers valuable insights. Theirs was a partnership rooted in intellectual and professional respect for one another. Something that was very rare at the time. And my I say something that you still find very rare even today. They worked together as missionaries, but more importantly also as educators. They also co-parented their child, an unusual type of thing at the time. They shared the parenting duties. Ubaba Marshall Maklake was known to be so deeply immersed in doing household chores, looking after their child. On an equal basis, they were able to work as a couple in their household, looking after their children. In reflecting on this, we come to understand that even though patriarchy may be a dominant current in a society, it should not be that it is surrendered to. Today we have patriarchy as one of the dominant behavioral traits that men resort to. Men can and must lead by example in treating women equally and that should begin at home. And that is where Charlotte McClurke and Marshall McClurke's marriage teaches us a wonderful lesson about the partnership between two people who were intellectuals and educators as well. Tanga yenze kaya kala ngoku ukufunda ngo Charlotte McClurke no Marshall McClurke. Meshalot was particularly passionate about the education of women. For her, education was that critical ingredient for the all-round development of women. As the constitution of the ANC Women's League describes it. She believed that one should uplift one another. She once said, this work is not for yourselves. Kill that spirit of self and do not live above your people, but live with them. And if you can rise, bring someone with you. And I'm so glad that this is like the motto that the ANC Women's League has now appropriated onto itself. This is a sentiment that the ANC continues to affirm in its policies, as well as in the programs of the government that it leads. 27 years into democracy, we have made significant strides in closing the gender parity in education. The strides we have made would have pleased Charlotte McClack. With regards to primary education, we're finding that 86% of girls attend primary school and data from the Department of Basic Education indicates that the girls are also more likely to finish schools. Yeah. Of last year's matriculation results, more girls attained bachelor's and diploma passes, <laughs> as well as passes with distinction. They didn't only end there, but one a distinction. Girls also produce more passes in the department's second chance metric programs. Yeah? On equitable access to higher education, we are also doing well comparatively. Women account for 59% of student headcount enrollments at South African universities and of these, the majority are African women. 
This is what Charlotte would have been pleased about. As we came in, I was asking a good professor about the gender mix of the students here. And he immediately said the majority of students they have here, 57% are women. So women are on the rise. According to the 2018 data from the National Research Foundation, women accounted for 75% of headcount enrollment in education, 63 in humanities and social sciences, as well as 57% in business and commerce. So they are advancing and getting into your more difficult areas, as well as advancing getting into that Bachelor of Science degree that is so rarefied that Charlotte McLeague excelled in. In the basic education sphere, though more girls enroll for mathematics than boys, boys perform better than girls. But I'm saying this so that we can encourage more girl children to enroll more and more in mathematics so that they can follow in Charlotte McLeake's footsteps. We must lend our support to increase the participation of girls in mathematics, in science, as well as in technology fields. This should be a strategy that includes setting participation and performance targets to have support programs for girl learners and we must promote their participation in things like maths olympiads and competitions but we must also support them with bursaries so that they can be high performing young people we must also look at what systems are in place to alleviate the burden of responsibilities women postgraduates carry and to what extent this prevents them from reaching doctoral level because we are still lacking in the number of women at the doctoral level. As an ANC government, we have to look at the discrimination pra practices within academia itself such as the lack of adequate advancement opportunities for women and pay disparities between male and female academics. As we have done so as an organization, we must continue to loudly demonstrate our intolerance to the terrible practice of sex for marks that turns universities and colleges into dens of exploitation of young female students. I mention this because it happens, and this must be brought to a stop. This is not limited to places of higher learning. Girls in school are more likely to experience sexual harassment and sexual assault, including from their own teachers. As is already being done through the National Strategic Plan, to combat gender-based violence and femicide. We must work harder to make places of learning safe for women and free from violence. We must continue to work with communities to overcome discriminatory practices, like taking young girls out of school early to work in the home, to care for the sick, family members or so, and to prepare them for marriage. This is what Charlotte McClarke would have been opposed to. There is indeed much work to be done still, much as we have made progress, but it does not detract from our great sense of pride at the greater representation of women in professional fields compared to what they were during Charlotte McClarke's time. The progressive and pro-women policies of the ANC and its government 
continue to level the playing field for women, enabling them to take their rightful place across society. This is in no small part due to the activism of the ANC Women's League and a number of other women's organizations. The ANC Women's League continues to play an important role in advocating for the rights of women both inside and outside of the organization. Women's rights and gender equality has been mainstreamed. It is no longer a source of wonderment to see a woman minister, a woman CEO, or a woman postgraduate as it was during Charlotte McClurkey's time. As we celebrate her, we also salute her altruistic spirit. When she climbed the ladder of success, she did not pull it down so that those who come after her should not climb as well. When she was a student at Wilberforce, she arranged opportunities for other African students to study there. It was, the ladder was left beneath so that its steps could be ascended by the next generation. Not only did her example inspire activists like Sibusisiwe Makanya, Bertha Towa, and many others, she also lured many other young women to climb the ladder of academia. The task before us now is to harness the potential of higher education for the advancement of women who make up more than half of our society or population. Women's education must play a greater role in supporting our national development particularly in the post-COVID-19 period. Last week, the World Economic Forum published its annual gender gap report. It ranks 156 countries based on gender disparities in economic participation and opportunity, as well as educational attain attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. We have fared well in some areas of economic participation and opportunity, including labor force participation and the number of female professionals and technical workers. In the latter category, we actually came number one, with 53% of such workers being female who are put into those important positions. In areas such as wage equality, for similar work, we've done less well. And this is also a burning matter in the ANC. And this is what we now need to address earnestly. I find the practice of unequal pay for women for equal work with male quite offensive and would like this practice to be banned and to be legislated against. We cannot have a situation where women are paid far less or even less than men for exactly the same amount of work that they do. It must be banned. According to the report, the economic downturn brought about by the pandemic has impacted women more severely than men, as we've often said. It has also set back gender parity by as much as a decade. This means we have even much harder work to do in the post-COVID-19 era. On the issue of broadening access to education for women, we should be leading and uh, we should also ensure that women play a leading role in academia, in business, as well as in government. Women's education must play a catalytic role in their economic empowerment, 
which is a long-standing objective of our movement and the government that it leads. We will continue to forge ahead with empowering the women of our country economically through a variety of programs and activities, through the co-ops that they participate in, through the various companies that they set up. It is women-led and women-owned businesses that must participate in the various aspects of our recovery program, whether it is in infrastructure, whether it is in food production, whether it is in any field, the women of our country must be given that opportunity to lead. It is also women-owned businesses that should take advantage of support and training opportunities currently underway to enable them to participate in public procurement. As we know, last year we announced that 40% of public procurement will be set aside for women-owned businesses. It is women, especially young women, who must take up opportunities provided through the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program as well. Women academics must also be at the forefront of research and inquiry into the pressing social problems of our day. Research that will guide our national response to pressing issues such as poverty, inequality, and underdevelopment. And it is women who must take their rightful place in the political life of our country as well, fulfilling our promises to our people calls for capable, ethical, and competent cadres at the helm. We have many such women leaders in our organization. To capacitate women, we must deal decisively with the residues of patriarchy that, yes, we still find even in our own movement. We must get rid of conservative attitudes and chauvinism that restrain women in the structures of our own movement. A degree certificate hanging on the wall is, should never be seen as the end of the line. And Charlotte McClurke never saw her BSc degree from Wilberforce University as the end of the line. Were this the case, Umamu McClurke would have retained, returned home to South Africa and settled down to a quiet life. Instead, she headed straight to the trenches of the struggle. Through the Bantu Women's League, she fought for the rights of women, particularly the demeaning practice of white employers forcing black women to undergo medical exemption, examinations before being employed. She was an agitator of political reform and attended, as we well know, the 1912 launch of the South African National Native Congress, the forerunner to our movement, the ANC. She was the only woman in attendance, showing just how determined she was to see that women's voices should be heard. It wasn't the first time either that Uma Musharraf Maklege had forced her way into male-only political gatherings, something the young people of today call gate crushing. An article published recently by the journalist uh, Zubaydah Jaffa talks about the so-called Lesiton incident in mid-1902. This was when Umamu Matlaike traveled to the annual meeting of the South African Native Convention near Queenstown. Ms. Jeffa is the author of Beauty of the Heart, coincidentally, and sadly one of the only biographies of Umamu Shalot Matlaike. Apparently Umamu Shalot caused quite a stir when she got to that meeting. 
She was the only woman in attendance and demanded clarity on the purpose and objectives of the conference and whether women could take part or not. In what could be called true Congress style, a committee was nominated to respond to her. See, when we've run out of ideas and we're not able to respond, we set up a committee. Would you, let's have a committee to look at this. And yet it was such a simple and straightforward matter that needed attention there and then. But we set up a committee. And that committee would have a subcommittee. And that subcommittee would have a task force. And that one would have a, another formation as well. The matter was tabled. And she was subsequently told the time was not right for women to take part. And the committee also said it was advisable for women to form their own movements. Of course, as history bears witness, she did just that. Umam Matayake also took up the cause of non-racialism in the early stages of our movement's existence. She took part and led in activities with women of all races united to the cause of gender equality. Non-racialism in the women's movement was strong in our history. From the 1956 Women's March to the formation of the Women's National Convention in 1992. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said of the, pre of the present day, just broadly across our movement. As we witness the concept of non-racialism being undermined, including, as I said, within our own movement, this is something we should actively guard against, not just as the ANC, but as a nation as well. Our country was founded in pursuit of non-racialism. The rise of various forms of chauvinism is something we should all be against because non-racialism is the glue that binds us together as a nation. Worker rights was another cause that Uma Musharad Matlega took up. In the 1920s, she campaigned against labor conditions for black workers and would go to the establishments of the employment agencies for Africans in 1928. Her passion for education led her to be called to testify at a government commission on African education, which was a first for an African to be called to a commission like that. She was also the first black woman to become a juvenile parole officer. The Cape Argus had these powerful words to say of her social work activities at the time. They said, open quotes, educated to take her place with the highest. She devoted herself to the lowest and most miserable, close quotes. That was Charlotte McClake. Umam Charlotte McClake was also a trailblazer in another important aspect, and that she affirmed the value of and respect for traditional leadership. It was respect she was granted in return. The positive work being done by her and her husband came to the attention of <clears throat> who invited them to take charge of his private school. During this time, she participated in the King's Court, something completely unheard of at the time for a woman. In his biography, Dr. Kuma relates that she was renowned for her courage as well as eloquence and was even given the name no gaso, as a salutation. There is indeed much we can learn and we can say about the life and times of Umam Charlotte Maklake. 
Just as she brought her education to bear to change society, so too must greater study opportunities for women yield positive outcomes for our country. Time and again, and throughout the course of history, women have proven that if just given an opportunity to better themselves, the benefits are multiplied, not sevenfold, not twofold, but multiple of times fold. That is what happens with women. Better educated women isn't only to create more breadwinners or to expand the workforce. Better educated women means better families, better communities, and a better society. In a chapter in his biography titled Why She Succeeds, Dr. Puma wrote, Charlotte's success has been due to no accident of favorable circumstances. I repeat, Charlotte's success has been due to no accident of favorable circumstances. It has been due to her ability with qualities of true leadership of which she has many. She knows that she knows and therefore leads along definite and sound lines according to her line. To her line. That's <laughs> now Omar Musharot Matlaike was a leading light who in turn gave light to others. Now, you know, in, in just going through the preparations for this input, I was just amazed at the measure of this lady that we are talking about today. And in a way you could even say that maybe we have never come across a woman like Charlotte Matlaike yet. Maybe we haven't. Now she would also have been a leading light even today in dealing with the challenges that we are grappling with right now. The challenges of COVID, of making sure that the infection rate in our country is brought under control, just as we are now rolling out the vaccines I can see Mama Charlotte McLeke would have been right at the forefront, right at the forefront campaigning and bringing our people together to go to the vaccination points. And yes, maybe where we make mistakes, Comrade Batabile, she would have criticized us. She would have chastised us. She would have shown us the way. She would have advised us. She would have said, Lapa President, you are making a mistake. We need people like I need those types of women. That is what we need. She would have been actively focused on how we should also find ways of the economic recovery that we are involved in. She would have wanted us to find ways of transforming our economy. As I said, she was imaginative, she was innovative, she was reflective, and she was clever. And she would have been actively involved with us to make sure that our country gets over this COVID challenge that we are facing now. Her preoccupation would also have been around how best can we empower the women of our country. As a Pan-Africanist, she would have immersed herself in ways in which the African continental free trade area would lead to the growth of our continent's economies. But more importantly, she would have wanted to find ways how can women of our continent and indeed our own country find ways in which they can be properly empowered 
through the African continental free trade area so that this free trade area agreement should not just be a nice talking point by political leaders but it should be something that they get deeply immersed in and empower themselves and empower their nations. When we examine Charlotte McClurgis life, what can we say we learn? We learn from her life's work and the many roles of leadership she played that leaders must be men and women who dedicate their lives to improving the life of others. They must be organizational and they must also be disciplined like she was. Umam Charlotte McLeke was never indisciplined. When the organization says, this is the decision, she was not one to say, I am going to do a different thing altogether. That is how disciplined she was. And that is precisely what is needed now. And she believed that leaders must focus on serving the people rather than serving themselves. Leaders must be people who can think about their actions and the good and the damage their actions can do to the interests of the people and their organizations. Soon after the ANC NEC declared 2021 as the year of Charlotte McClake, when we released the January 8th statement, I've asked myself a number of times as I was going through just the preparations for this input. What would Charlotte McLeke have done in dealing with the challenges that we face in our movement? What I do know is that she would have been doggedly focused on the unity and the renewal of the African National Congress. She would have made it her daily task to her, this would have meant that there should not be any form of factionalism in the organization and she would have refused to be a member or a participant in any faction that could have come up about. She would have said, I any factions. Affection and gena wuyo ye African National Congress gupe. What I also do know is that she was such a woman of integrity, a woman of substance, and that she would have said no to corruption. She would have said no to corruption. That is what Uma Musherot McLeague would have done. Because she would have known over the corruption in the African National Congress is like poison. It's like poison and it kills. First it will kill the organization and then it will kill our people's appetite to support the African National Congress. And she would have refused to participate in any corruption. O Mama O Charlotte McLeake was a leader who was imaginative and she always reflected on issues of the time both in her own country as well as on the African continent as well as globally. She knew that leadership should be based on knowledge, on competence and experience and dedication and hard work. As we keep her legacy flame burning bright, let it illuminate and allow to emerge. We must allow many more Charlotte McLeagas to emerge. Men and women 
must come to the fore and say, Ndim law with Charlotte Matlek. That's what we should all be doing. It is now up to the new generation of women activists to take forward the struggle for the full emancipation of women in the cause of a better South Africa. Uma Mushalot laid the foundation. We now need people who will finish the job. I speak particularly of those in the ranks of the ANC, Women's League Young Women's Desk, and the newly formed ANC Youth League National Task Team. Because you are the future. They are the future. Umama Charlotte McLeague was the future of her time and we've now had to take the baton from her. We're counting on the young people of our country to complete what Umama Charlotte McLeague started. It is a cause that can no longer be deferred. As W.E.B. Dubois said, it is today that we fit ourselves for the greater usefulness of tomorrow. Today is the seed time. Now are the hours of work. And tomorrow comes the harvest, close quotes. This great woman and many other great women like her were that seed. They were the seed. I speak here of women like Umama Olilian Goy. Albertina Susulu, Helen Joseph, Upetha Kowa, Uwinima Tigizela Mandela, and many others. They were the seed, and we saw the harvest that they brought home. Let us indeed work to develop this generation's women and harness the reaping of the seed. Let the multitudes of Charlotte MacLeagas rise and come to the fore. This is where the poem that I used in the State of the Nation, Ega Maya Angelo, comes to mind. I rise. I rise. And we want to see many Charlotte MacLeagas rising and rising amongst the young people of our country. Thank you very much.